Yeah, and uh, I, I'll jump in just by saying this, like, you, you know, we played together in that tour, which was such a beautiful tour, really. I, I enjoyed it so much in 2004, it was, I checked the other I know, I can't I believe it was so long ago. Yeah, <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was you and Taishan right. making this incredible rhythm section. And I, I remember I wrote really long tunes, yeah. like lots of odd meters, like, quite complicated and you just cruised through it like a mother Beep. <laughs> like with such a ease and I you know I, I listened to you then later what you've done your own work and with other people and you seem to play with such an ease through odd meters and I wanted to start this mm -hmm. like how did you learn this and uh, how is your approach actually of playing these odd meters when you have like really complex structures not talking about seven but let's say you know, like 17 or 19 or like long, long things? That's a, that's a good question because I think it's something that I'm still kind of thinking about. And oftentimes I think I'm, I have this tendency to just go into something without really knowing how it's going to work out. So oh, wow. I'm really okay. listening to to what what's going on around me and trying to react, and then sometimes I'm I'm listening for cues and clues as to where exactly I am. Mm. Sometimes I'm very sometimes I'm I can feel very clear, but when things get it when things are pretty complicated, there's an element of uh, of uh, really listening to hear where the time is. And it's mm. it's almost like thinking of the meter as a time, a, a, a section of time, not necessarily like um, a, a meter, but a, a length of time. Hmm. So, like, for example, and I'm not, I mean, this is something that I would work on at different points and have different, um, different levels of success at, you know, there's always, you're always trying to figure out how to make it seem as, as relaxed or clear as possible. Yeah. Um, but I think of this, um, what, something that I, I remember, uh, Joel Lovano talking about, and he would talk about it in relation to, to like, um, uh, like Paul motion. And, and I don't, I mean, it's only, it's something that I heard him. It's, I, I, I haven't really, um, spent much time playing with him, but I remember doing workshops and, oh, wow. and, you know, that, that Lovano was giving, I would, I got to play. I, there was something back in 1995, this, Institute was the Schweitzer Institute, and it was Lavana was one of the uh, instructors. So there was a there was it was a long period of time that we were all in this area. Actually, uh, uh, Angelica Sanchez was there, oh, wow. and uh, um, Andrew Rathbun. Oh, and, wow. uh, yeah, beautiful. And yeah, a friend of mine named Peter Retzlaff. He was a yeah, sure. great drummer. Yeah, we actually drove to that. We drove across country together, me and Peter. Wow, <laughs> from New York. Yeah, that's a. There's a whole. That was fun though. It was great. Anyway, I'm getting very off topic here. No, so no, no. Point, you got for it. <laughs> but the point that one of the things that Lovano talked about that I thought was 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 really great was. Um, like he would always talk about the big beat, you know, in other words, he was saying, thinking about 
in four he he was mostly speaking of yeah. but just that you weren't trying to play every little subdivision or note that you were you were you had a starting point and an ending point and your ending point was you know like the next bar or it could be you know it doesn't have to be the downbeat but you would know where the next bar was or where the second you know the third bar was the beginning of the next bar after that so i i think that that's one of the things i have um think about especially when i work with um in situations where there's a meter that is repetitive too yeah exactly if you do that you have you it, it becomes malleable and of course you end up coming out with with these uh these groupings that probably are studied by you know some you know drummers and stuff and they probably really maybe have that lined up in a way you know i mean someone like dan weiss or something you know of yeah, course sure. you know would be somebody who might be able to just like deconstruct that type of thing but but it's funny when you just do it you know you're 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 trying you're getting into this into the flow of that meter and mm. just kind of being like okay it's you're trying to breathe with it you know and i think that's really where it starts to become something where you it's almost like trying playing so much more freely within that mm. yeah i mean because because when i listened to you playing with tyson or you know he played <laughs> He played amazingly, but he didn't really help you in a way, in a most positive right, sense. Right, right, right. Like, you know, he no, played know like, you <laughs> like incredible stuff over it so creatively. And yeah, 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 yeah. And you went with him, but you were still an anchor. And right, you know, how, how does this, you know, what, let's say you're playing with Nasheed or with Dan Weiss or with Tyson or with whoever, right. with these amazing drummers. Yeah, right, right, right. But, what makes it different for you or special for you? <laughs> the approach you yeah. approach playing. I mean, it's a musical situation. It's different always, but still. Right, right. I, well, I can, uh, for example, um, I remember playing some of the stuff that you were talking about. One of the things that I know that I recognize in, in someone like Taishan is that he's, he's, um, really able to like if you can kind of get into the same flow of time then anything is going to be possible you're kind yeah. of and he listens so much too that if you guys if you're if you're attuned to one another you can really um come up with that kind of fluidity but still be metrically um accurate yeah exactly exactly and and that's I, I i've certainly i've had that experience with him and I, and I remember doing that but i haven't i'm also also with a sheet too um there's some uh working with amir el safar yeah. yeah that's that's definitely been that and you know i know i think we did some some gigs with dan like that too you know and and so it's 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 really like kind of feeling being a little more uh free in the in your in your approach to playing you know like those yeah. those guys are very much like that you know um and I, I i feel like when we did that playing with taishan you know you just get into a certain kind of flow there are other people like I feel like um, I feel like Marcus Gilmore. Mm, like yeah, that. exactly. Yeah, you know, another example. Yeah, where you know, I, and I really, you know, I haven't played with a lot of these guys in a long time. Well, I played with Nashi with 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 uh, Amir, right? With Amir, so that's yeah. good. Um, but a lot of the other guys, 
you know, I'm just not in situations where I play with them, but when we have, you know, in the past, that's what I felt was, uh, um, the thing that kind of allowed you to have it feel very, have it feel focused, have it feel, you know, accurate, but not feel like it's stiff. So that, that fluidity is something that, that, uh, that is a big part of it. I, yeah. But the thing is, in all in all honesty, I don't think that there's really a lot of music being made that way. Yeah, you know, I think I think a lot of stuff is is uh, is about you know accuracy and 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 uh, execution. Yeah. And so what happens is that <laughs> it's you don't really get to. Even if that's something that you do, you have to find other people that you can work with in that context. Not to say that everybody's got to be like completely not about doing, you know, playing. No, 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 no. Obviously, yeah. those guys can really, the guys that we're talking about can really do that. Um, and I think there's other musicians too, you know, other instruments too. That oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Have that. I mean, yeah, you know, and I mean it more in the sense of, I'm trying to think of just examples of, you know, off the top of my head, it's like, but it's, it's one of those things where it's a very, it's, it's something that's not really uh, tangible. You can't really say, this is what we do. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah it's so many drummers. I mean, you know, I played with Gerald the Cleaver. He's the oh, same yeah. man. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. You know, just like stretching the time 100%. within. It's like, it's yeah. just, just how you do that, you know? Yeah, no, I know he's he's another um, master of that. And then you ask him, and I asked him that, and he was just like, "Man, he started explaining about how, how he sees the meter in different times." Or like, I was like, "Right, Man, okay, I'm I'm lost." <laughs> you know, it's just wow, it's wow, just, wow, yeah, it's so incredible to listen to that. I was like, "Wow, really, Jesus, man!" You know, it's like as if he slows down the time. Of, right, it's just like it's beautiful. It was like he, a fairy, fairy tale, almost like you know. Yeah, no, he's another one who's masterful at that. I've only played with him a handful of times. We we actually had a very. He's such a beautiful person. Yeah, you know, amazing human yeah. being, you know. And we, we had we had a really nice rapport. So, like personally, it was nice. You know, he he's he's somebody that that I hope to get to you know do some playing with in the yeah. future. It's yeah. uh, yeah, you know all those guys. Just, yeah. Not like it's not like I, I don't want to play with the you know, but no, it's no, so. Sir. But uh, but it's really, you know, I think the hard part is, uh, you know, is just trying to find those situations that you can do it. You can expand, yeah. That's lo longer yeah. tours help that that if you have like ten gigs yeah, or fourteen, true. True. then you can actually do this. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. True. Uh, Carl, I wanted to ask you about you. You, you mentioned Amir, and uh, I listened uh, El Safar the other day to the other shore, which is oh yeah, such a beautiful record, you know, and oh, thanks, completely He's different great. than what you guys did before, at least in my years. Kind of, it's mm -hmm. like an upgrade. And I wanted to ask you, how did your story with Amir begin, and uh, how did that happen? Oh yeah, wow, that's so. Because you've done so many records already together and playing. Yeah, that. So that. So. So Amir, I think it was, uh, I want to say it was 90, no, was it 99 or 2000? Oh, wow, right. Really? Oh. 2000, I would say, that um, Amir had, had went, Amir's from Chicago, and he went to DePaul University. I, and my understanding is that when he was at DePaul, um, that's where he met Rudresh Mahatapa. Ooh, and okay. Rudresh was doing his, uh, his, I think, a master's there and was, you know, like a teaching assistant or that kind of thing. And, he, and Amir actually uh, studied some with Rudresh and was also um, – you know, kind of, they became friends. And when um, Amir moved to New York, um, he he met up with Rigrish and played with him sometimes. And that's how we mm. met. Like, actually, the first time Amir, 
I think this was one of the first sessions that Amir did in New York, and it was a session with at at uh at Nasheed's place, his his uh, oh. basement with with uh, Rudresh, myself, and Vijay. Oh Vijay man, and Nasheed, and we played. We just played, you know that that session, and uh, and that was kind of the first time, you know, that I met. Amir and then you know he 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 kind of traveled a lot he did a lot of stuff he after you know being in New York for a while he was playing with Rudresh some and yeah. different projects and um and uh then that's how we started but it was 2006 I believe where the first version of the two rivers yeah which was the the smaller group started and that was that was where we uh, where we began, you know, began like a more uh, official, regular. You yeah, know, kind of, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we just it was it's been um, fifteen years. Fifteen years, yeah, yeah. And it's still we wow. did, yeah. We did a couple things. We did something over the summer at this new place, Little Island. It's a not it's it's an outdoor venue, outdoor park in New York. It's really beautiful. Uh, and they had this outdoor theater that overlooks the Hudson River. You know, it's an amphitheater. It's not yeah. enclosed, but and uh, that was kind of you know, unofficially um, you know, like kind of the 15th anniversary concert, oh. you know. And then we did something else uh, a couple weeks ago in, um, in Kansas at the Lead Center. Oh, well. Yeah, so it it's but yeah that's how like i've just been doing that music with him from that time which is it's been really challenging in the sense that learning how to deal with some of those uh the macam you know scale yeah. stuff um over time and some of the different rhythm um like they're not time signatures they are but they're not really that's not how they're they're so embedded in in the 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 culture that it's like they're called their dances you know, yeah they, exactly they still yeah. maintain those names like georgina or yeah yeah or there's there's like there's a lot of different things that um you know i i would certainly like to study more of that in 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 depth um, because it's really it's really interesting, but I think that's also that goes back to that whole concept that we were speaking about earlier. It's like it's it's the movement of time, you know, not yeah. so much not exactly. so much like this, you know, this subdivided um, just that, you know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's how I that's how I met him. Interesting. Oh, well, that's a long a long time ago. Yeah. Probably met him. Yeah, I think it. It's got to be two thousand. If I didn't, I might have met him before that, but that was the first time we got together. Oh, amazing! Yeah, the, yeah, crazy. I mean, you moved to New York what in early nineties, right? Yeah, ninety three. How how was that? This initial New York experience for you when you came because the nineties were I, I don't know, maybe it's me, but when I to, to check the what was happening there, it's it was such an amazing creative hub happening how, how, how was your first impression how did you started making it there like you remember that uh, yeah I, I i feel like you know it was interesting because i was in school and uh so it was a very um like a very straight ahead type of school at manhattan mm -hmm. school of music for my for oh, my yeah. master's and it wasn't it wasn't a it wasn't bad it was just that it was it was interesting in the sense that a lot of the a lot of the people that were there at the time um, were very much into playing you know more straight ahead stuff yeah. learning you know blue note stuff and and so that was cool it was it was something that it was really good to be surrounded by and kind of have some of that influence but there was also other stuff going on but it was it was almost 
like there were there really if you were just trying to play you know you were just trying to play sessions with people which was going on a lot at the school in the evenings yeah um you know that's what you ended up doing those are those are the people who are playing the most but at the same time you know there were other people there at the same time that were just like um like jason moran was there mm. and, uh and um and eric harlan was there for for a little bit too um and and uh who was this oh i'm trying to think of some other well a lot of guys went there after like you know mm. after i was there like miguel zanon was there oh, yeah. dan was there you know those guys were there like the next class you know like kind of right <laughs> after i left and then um but i was there with uh with luis perdomo too oh yeah well yeah so there was there was a lot of um really great musicians who were there and so in a way it was kind of interesting because you know i was trying to just play you know get as much experience playing and then there was also um so this place called augie's which used to be oh, yeah. yeah where smoke is now you know and that was still happening so you could go down there and see a lot of people play um a lot of times I saw Joel Fromm down there. Oh, really? Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. And uh, there were a lot of great musicians who would play there. I mean, it was that was actually not that far from Manhattan School of Music. It was uptown. So um, there was a lot of people. This trumpet player named Scott Wenholt was mm -hmm. there. Dave Berkman would be there. Oh, yeah. Ben Street. Uh, Doug yeah. White. Um Joe Farnsworth, Peter Bernstein, and Goldings, Larry Goldings. I saw yeah. him. The, you know, like these. Yeah. Uh, what? Um, um, I think his name is Jim, oh Jim Rotundi. I think was his oh, name. Oh yeah, the trumpet yeah. player. Yeah. yeah, and Eric Alexander. Yeah. So all those guys were like doing, you know, mostly more straight ahead, but they straight were ahead gigs. Yeah, ahead. yeah. But they were they were doing their own their own thing you know um yeah and then if you know going down i mean it was funny because we were all way uptown so you had to go go downtown if you were checking out anything else i think <laughs> um uh going down to the knitting factory and stuff was definitely part of it you know that was where i could see more creative things also yeah. Whatever was happening at the Iridium at the time, because the Iridium at that time was still like more of a jazz club. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it still is in a way, but it's 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 a lot different than it used to be. I know what you mean. Yeah. 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 Um, so, but it was it was more just trying to meet people and play with people, you know, um, wherever that took me. A, a lot of times, it, you know, the the more that. I, the longer I was in New York, the more I saw that, you know, people, there were a lot of people who were living out in Brooklyn and a lot more playing possibilities out there in terms of session, yeah. sessioning, playing with other musicians. Like that's, I think in 99, the first time I met Rudrish was actually playing a session uh, at Hari Honing's place with, with Rudrish. And oh. I forgot who this was playing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like Maybe. that's how that's yeah. So it was, you know, there was that was a time when I think um, who else was playing and yeah, he had some different bands, different. You know, I remember going out to the Internet Cafe. That was another spot way downtown. Um, yeah, and it was like it, that was a point where the uh, I think Rudrich had a band with with. Uh, Ari and Francois Moutin and um, oh, yeah, exactly. Ben Monder at that time. With so Monder, kind of, really? Yeah, Monder. Really? Oh, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, I mean, they, you know, I don't know how many, how often that band performed, but I, they, oh, wow. I, I think there was a, at least a few gigs that they did together. Mm, I would that love comedy. to hear that, man. That sounds, that sounds a good, like, a good yeah. band. Like, wow. <laughs> it was, there was some really, there was definitely some intense stuff, but it was really like 
there was always something to go see. Yeah, sure. I got to see some some people that I was really, you know, I was lucky I got to see Elvin. You know, mm, that oh, really? Oh, well. Yeah, yeah. Definitely really an amazing experience. Um, I think one of the things that I didn't really, I think I was probably a little bit overwhelmed by being in New York in a way. Like there was an element of, of, I didn't go out to every club or all these clubs on a regular basis or even like going into smalls and stuff, you mm. know, like that was something that happened for me later. Um, Interesting. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't, I think at that point it was just, it was, I think I was probably like worried about, Oh, I don't really know, you know, <coughs> 500 standards that I need to know to play at one least. <laughs> Uh, you know, and it's not really, it probably wasn't entirely true. It was just that I didn't, I was like, oh, I'm not, you know. So I, I, I probably didn't go to a lot of these things that I would have benefited from had mm. I gone. But, you know, I, I, we all take our own path, I guess. That's oh, really sure. Yeah. 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 But you, you mentioned Luis Perdomo and Miguel Zanon. And yeah. I, I kind of, you started like, it's funny because you're playing with Amir and you played with Rudresh, so you're kind of exploring right. all these, not let's call it straight ahead, paths, right. but like all these outer paths. Also, like how did you like jump into the Latin world? You were quite oh. active in that. Like how did that happen? I mean, well, it's interesting because I, I, it's funny. I, <laughs> it's funny that you ask because in a certain way, my experience down here and in Miami and then kind of being separate from New York. I'm like, am I part of the Latin world? I'm not even sure. <laughs> There's so much, it's so deep. What, but, uh, but yeah, what, what happened was that I was playing with, um, with Luis and I was playing with, uh, this drummer named Vince Cherico who, and, um, Vince is a great drummer, Latin jazz drummer. And, um, through him, I ended up playing some gigs with Ray Barreto. Mm. Oh, wow. Yeah. And that was, that was a really great opportunity. You know, it seemed like uh, it was going to be good. But then what ended up happening was that his, his old bass player became available again. <laughs> so I basically played like a week, a couple gigs. You know, I played like, you know, like a, a week at the Blue Note with him. And I did like oh, one wow. or two other things. And then it was like, yeah, that was great. All right, take care. <laughs> oh man! <laughs> so it, I, I felt like more of it was was really about the fact that um, what had happened. You know, it's like one of those stories that basically yeah. someone be someone that wasn't available, sort of. They there was a yeah. little bit of a falling out, whatever. They they you know got themselves they made up, and uh, and then you know I was more of a sub in that situation yeah, yeah. So, you know uh but as a result um after that i started playing with through vince i started playing with this other um conguero named uh shambo corniel he was this uh he's still around this great percussionist and he he uh had this latin jazz group like a quintet you know with saxophone um, piano, bass, drums, and percussion. And we did a couple records actually oh. with that group. And one was actually nominated for a Latin, a, a Grammy for best Latin jazz album. Oh, wow. So, but it wasn't, um, it wasn't a Latin Grammy. It's so funny because you start, those things get confused sometimes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. So, so, and, Actually, I should. I have to be uh, fair. In between, bef before all that, um, I was working with. So I knew I was friends with Donnie McCaslin, and we knew each other for a really. I met him early on in New York. Oh, really? We, oh man! Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Donnie, yeah, yeah. It's it great, dude, man. And uh, and we had played a couple of gigs. Actually, the funniest part, man, like. We'd done some gigs with um, 
with uh, Seth Abrams. Uh, Abramson, the guy he 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 was. Uh, I always mess up his last name. I've seen him a million times. He books. He booked the Jazz Standard. Mm, shit, yeah, yeah. Okay. He, was, he played guitar. He was a really, really? good guitar player. I didn't know. Yeah. So, so um, you know, we we played gigs together with Seth, Peter Retzloff, and Donnie. Oh wow, man! At, at this place called the um, the the Squire, used to be the Angry Squire, but then it became the Squire. It was a place over on like on 23rd street and 7th Avenue, this little place that, and they would have, you know, they used to have little jam sessions. They had, they had stuff going on though. It was like a, it was like this place that people would play at, you know? Yeah. Um, uh, and then I think little by little, you know, that just maybe the location or just the fact that the culture in New York changed, you know? Yeah. So time goes on and a place like that closes. Um, but anyway, that's, that was, uh, how I met Donnie was through that experience with Seth and Peter. And then I, I, I mean, this is, I assume before he started what the company rabbit moon productions, I think is the name of the company. Mm -hmm. Um, and anyway, so Donnie recommended me to this guy, this Argentine or Argentinian composer and guitarist named Fernando Torres. And he had a band that was like very much about playing Argentinian folkloric music in the context of, uh, you know, with a jazz part yeah. to aspect to it. Did, didn't Benny, it was, Benny recorded with this guy, right? Also, I David. think he did actually. <laughs> yeah, I, I think so because I have one record of. I think Benny I gave think, me a record. To, yeah, I think that would not surprise me, Benny. Uh, that's a whole other story. That's funny. So I, I had done the. Um, I was playing with that band, and uh, and that was with Donnie and um, Tino Dorado was playing in that band at oh, that yeah. time, yeah. and uh, and Dan Reeser. Oh wow. Oh. And, and so we were playing, you know, this also very difficult music for me at the time, you know, was just because it was, it was not really like Afro-Cuban Latin, yeah. which, which I probably wasn't really that experienced with at that point either, but it was like something else, you know? <laughs> so uh, it was, it was interesting. It was cool. It was very it was really good music, but I think that was, that was probably my first um, real experience dealing with, with Afro Latin type, you know, yeah. music, something that was not jazz. It's different. Was, yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. It was something that was, you know, in that related to jazz because that was what they chose to do with it. There was some great, great music there. And all these people played like, um, who else played? Uh, uh, there was this drummer named Falk Willis, who uh, who played. Now he, I don't think he plays drums. He got out of it. You know, he 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 was like, no, I'm not doing this anymore. <laughs> he stopped. <laughs> yeah, sure. And uh, and uh, uh, John Hollenbeck did it a little bit. Oh really? Oh wow. And then, uh, and I think Bit, um, Benny subbed on some stuff for Donnie and then probably played on some, some of the stuff. But we did a tour where we went to Portugal. And oh, really? We, oh, wow. Yeah, man. And, wow. Yeah. Benny, <laughs> Benny and I got, got pretty crazy one night for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. I did like one tour with Benny prior oh, to the tour we did and it was like a okay. 10 day tour and it was yeah it was quite yeah, crazy, yeah, yeah. You know? it was amazing we had we had we definitely had had have some stories from that one <laughs> <laughs> uh 
<laughs> so yeah, that's that's kind of how all that. Oh well, then after all that though, because of my connection, you know, with um, with Vince and also the saxophone player who was playing in that that band with the band that I was talking about, Chembo, yeah. which Chembo. Um, I started. I got connected to um, Arturo Farrell. Oh wow. And that was actually partially through Vince and also um, David Bixler, that that guy we were speaking about prior to going yeah. on there. Uh, and um, that was so I started playing with Bixler, and he had this project with Arturo, and and it was like Celtic music with <laughs> with you know like involved with like you know this this kind of Latin jazz element. Yeah. I mean, nuts. And, and it worked. That was what was crazy about. It. I was like, "Wow, this is really this makes sense," and uh, and it was uh, that was cool. So I, you know, at that then I started playing with Arturo some, which was great. And um, uh, you know, that was that was really a longer, probably the longest time that I've worked with somebody um, in that type of music. Yeah. I mean, th the band. The band with Chembo was also going on for a long time too. So those two things were were long term groups. But I didn't really do that much outside of those groups. You know, like I wasn't like you know playing salsa gigs or yeah, you know, okay, yeah. all this type of stuff. Where um, so it's but it's always been you know because of these associations, I I have this 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 um reputation so you know of doing some of that which mm. i mean i'm definitely into yeah um, sure. but it's funny because you see how you know there's there's a uh like there's so it's such a deep um uh culture and musical experience that that it's like that's just scratching the surface in a way yeah yeah know? sure yeah you know, like this i mean there's other other things i've gotten to do for sure um we did actually we did a recording that was one of i believe might have been the pianist hilton ruiz his last recording oh uh -huh. right yeah with chembo and and this flautist named andrea black uh brackfield um so you know there was definitely some stuff that was that was really good from all that um but oh, it's okay. it's it's yeah it's pretty cool then there was uh this this spanish um accordionist that i worked with victor prieto yeah I, yeah i remember that yeah, yeah victor. i remember that yeah yeah exactly and uh so a lot of little things that that led to other projects um, yeah sure that's how it yeah. works yeah. Yeah. I, I wanted to ask you, like you mentioned Europe and going crazy with Vinny, but when was the first time uh, you went to Europe and with whom was that? Do you remember oh. like, jazz-wise? Oh, that's a good... Wow. I feel like... Oh, wow. This is, this is, that's a good question because there was a... Um... I'm not really sure. I feel like there was something I did where I went over in the mid '90s. '90s already. Oh wow. Okay. But uh, I'm having a hard time placing it. Like I'd have to look at my um, like my old passport or something to see yeah, if yeah. I remember. Sure. Um, I went. I want. I, there was there were two things. There was one thing that I feel like I just don't remember what it was, but I feel like I I might have gone with this one group that was more like of a swing group, but oh, I'm not oh. sure. <laughs> I actually don't remember. I feel like we did, but uh, the the wild nineties in Europe, man. <laughs> I, yeah right right it's all no, I, out, yeah. you know it's like man what did we do what did we take what do we do <laughs> <laughs> no yeah exactly i actually this was this was one of those things that i i'm just like did i do that with these people or not because there was a couple of it was kind of one of these situations where you were just like yeah i don't know 
Well, I'm gonna yeah. do it. But I, I do remember going uh, uh, definitely <laughs> an early time would have been actually with that group with Donnie and Fernando. Mm, okay. um, we went to we went to uh, and and Tino um, and Dan Reeser. We went to Spain mm. and we and we uh, which was cool. We did a couple. Wow, of beautiful. Yeah. There. yeah, that was probably like. <laughs> I'm gonna say 96, 97, something. Wow, like that. Okay, early. Yeah. Yeah. And then, Amazing. yeah. Yeah. No, it was it was cool, but you know, I was never somebody who was really like uh, on the road all the time. Yeah, yeah. You know, like some guys are they're just on the road all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sure. I remember like the, I played with Rainey with Tom. Oh in, yeah. Two thousand and six. Yeah. And we did a tour with him and Drew Grass and Trio. Oh and nice. R R Rainy was in Europe already. I think back. This is like you know when they still it, it was touring. It was possible. I, I think yeah. it was like prior to me ten days on a tour with Malaby, and then before that two weeks with Burn, and before that so you know he was in Europe yeah. for four months doing. Wow. You know, like hundred gigs in or something like that, and wow, like that's amazing. The stuff like that. I was like, man, Jesus, that's. And still playing, you know, music actually, like with energy. Right, right, right. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 is does that happen anymore? Is the question? No, no. Yeah, I think with everyone I talk to, it's like if if you're lucky if you got like Tim Byrne had a tour now, and I think they had like eight gigs, seven, wow. which is a lot already nowadays. Right. Yeah. Right. You know. Now, so, would you say that? Just just curious. Are you speaking like? pre-pandemic or just i think already pre-pandemic was quite heavy it was already yeah. like many clubs already, closed yeah. in germany and austria because the funding got worse and you know oh right right, right. And now post-pandemic or still during or whatever you want to call it it's right, it, right. of course it's worse so. yeah gotcha so, you know not for the superstars but like kind of this yeah right exactly <laughs> creative music what we've been talking before like you know yeah or if you the more creative you get the worse it is in a way yeah. sadly but oh uh, yeah <laughs> I'll, I'll keep it here so <laughs> I'll keep it here. no no comment no, <laughs> no just to return to i wanted to ask you one thing always we haven't spoken since and uh you know, when Brain Dance, your record came out. Yeah. I, I was just stunned because it's still one of my favorite records. Oh, thank you, man. I'm it's, glad you enjoyed it. Just like, you know, you and Justin and Vijay and Mark, it's just such a tight unit and you wrote such amazing music. Oh, thank and, you. You know, like for Odo and the Circular Vos, I think, and those tunes, it's just amazing, like tightly knit lines and unisonance and I wanted to ask you, like, how did you, being a band leader, how come you didn't do more of that? I, because it's such a good record. And, uh, like, how Thank did you, you feel about that record? And how did you compose music? Or do you still compose music for groups? Like, all of this band leading stuff. I mean, many questions. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I I was, I feel like, like, um there were a lot of things that that I was not able to really get from that recording. You know, I, I, I felt like, like it was, it could have gotten, I couldn't really do much more than I did with it for whatever reason. It just wasn't, no one was really like, it got really good critical yeah. um, reviews but it wasn't like somebody was like, oh, we really want to do something with you and try and make some, mm. you know, like a tour or whatever. And short of having the, you know, short of really just doing the stuff that I, I wasn't really familiar with or didn't really have the confidence or knowledge to go about, you know, trying to do something, put something together myself. I, I didn't yeah, really, like push anything. I, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I was really like, I kind of sat there feeling a little bit like, wow, this was, I think this was really pretty good for, for a first, you know, release. And I didn't really, um, yeah, it's weird. I mean, I didn't really feel like I could 
I didn't really know what to do mm. after like I and then you start having to deal with just the realities of the finances of me. Yeah, sure. Okay. That's yeah, yeah. And so so that was the other thing. I I was like, man, I need to do something soon. I need to do, you know, I was like, I gotta do something by within the next year, the next year. And then, you know, here it is like 10 years since it was released, and I haven't put out another record. Mm. And um it's one of those things where uh, but you just, good. Do you still feel the urge to, to compose and to do it? Like, or I do. I think that that's something that, you know, every what happens is that everything that you start to do, you know, every new little project, for example, um, me, me coming down here to do this, you know, that, that ties it, that really makes it difficult to do some your own project at that yeah, point. sure oh now i have i'm kind of um prior to that because i can't say that i've been down here for 10 years <laughs> i i i'd have to say i think there was a little bit of just trying to figure out how to get money um grant sure. stuff i just i i got i was able to get these um commissions like new york state council of the arts I did that, which was what allowed me to do that recording. Um, but I think that without a real a great deal of funding, it's hard to yeah. Yeah. You do that kind of stuff. And um, it was for me the the artistry of the music didn't seem to be enough to warrant anybody wanting to give you anything. Sure. No one was like, oh let me get you know let me get a uh how many times have i did i apply to chamber music america with that recording mm. and like you know yeah sure i didn't have a good enough story or something yeah yeah, yeah. and so um i think that a lot of the ideas that uh um you know, that I had about trying to do that were, were kind of like, oh, okay, so I have to regroup this. And I think then at the same time, the climate really changed in terms of having to have a very, very specific narrative about whatever it is that you're going to put out. Yeah, I agree. And yeah. now... Now it's completely like different climate again. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so um, that was a big part of why a lot more didn't happen now of course you know when you look back 10 years you're like well if i had done this different or that different or then you know there's so many things you can look back upon sure. and say uh and you know i look at my entire career and i'm like that oh well you know <laughs> there are things that i wasn't i didn't maybe give enough weight to or you mm -hmm. know there's all kinds of things no, that sure. you, I know what you, mean. Yeah. you look back upon with 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 greater wisdom no but it's like you, you know J jerome harris right yeah 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 so, uh, I, I, he said he was so cool when we talked and i asked him like he did two records in the early 90s like incredible records one Eric yeah. Dolphy stuff and one original music oh wow and so like that's early 90s man that's like yeah. 25 years yeah. ago and I asked yeah. him like well how come you didn't do records as a band leader and he was like and I, I I always I will always remember this like he said you know okay first of all yes I'm a musician but I'm also a human being and right. you know music is important but you know I also want to live in you know, this sense and I was like right. man shit yeah that's yeah that's a good answer also you know it's yeah no that's true it's true I mean you know, I think yeah that's i mean jerome is a, such a beautiful person yeah. as well he's such he's yeah always always been i've always had great interactions with him he's just such a kind person yeah and just a great musician um but i i, I uh yeah he, he's completely right i mean i think that in certain ways the that's one of the reasons why i was just so like burnt out mm -hmm. left you know yeah. I, sure. I mean i still you know i still have an apartment there um that i'm renting out 
Uh, yeah. But everything changed with the with the pandemic in a way too. Sure. So then yeah. it becomes like, well, am I am I going back? I don't know, you know. Um, yeah. uh, but you know, I have family up there, so of course I will be in the area. But but I think you know, I was whether it was you know you you can look at it so many different ways you can say there are all these out these these things that are that are affecting sure external factors going to yeah, yeah yeah external factors and then also your own your own decisions. reaction yeah. to those things and decisions in general that that contribute to how you decide you know what you decide is like the best thing for you and and also that can contribute to things not being as good as as they could be in what the situation oh, sure. we're yeah. in, you know. So you, so I certainly feel like that's a big one of the things that I was, I was just like I. By the time I left, you know, um, I was really glad. It was a good decision for me, you know, mm -hmm. to come down here. Um, but at the same time, you know, trying to to navigate any time that you have that's just completely um empty it's void of responsibility mm -hmm. you everybody has larger responsibility but you know you don't have anything that you're i have to be at this meeting at this time i have to do this yeah. um has became more and more difficult for me to manage and i think that's what was happening for me in new york you know i was just like i can't this is too much you know i didn't have enough I don't know what you mean. No. Like, yeah. You know, I wasn't like at a rehearsal every day. I wasn't doing this. I wasn't doing that. And then I just felt like it was, you know, it became really difficult. And I think what I'm, what's funny now is that I'm, I'm readjusting to that because I had three years of basically having a job by being in school and being yeah. a teaching assistant, all that stuff. So now I'm like, oh, I don't really have, oh God, I have so much to do, but I don't have to be anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> it's liberating in a way yeah yeah it's liberating but the but the depth you know you realize like how yeah. responsible you have to be to yeah. to sure. live that kind of life you know sure yeah. um but i know there was some other stuff to that question i'm sorry it went very very uh no 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 but i just you know i love the tracker i still listen to that i remember i i then bought it through this platform e-music or i think it was called e -music. oh right right you could you know i still have it on my computer and i you know i sometimes i do shuffle and right or something will come up yeah, pop yeah. Up. I'm like, what is this and then i check man really you, i'm always surprised yeah, right, right. And, right and right 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 i just wanted to ask you about your composing how did you approach that record uh because it, it's really complex in a way well, not in a way, it is complex, but again, it sounds so fluid and, but you wrote some really heavy stuff. So how did you approach writing for that record? How was the story so, there? So I was, uh, I, I was, I would be writing like every once in a while, I'd be right thinking of a baseline and then I, I would write stuff down over time. You know, there was a lot of sketches of things and then um, there was also this idea of taking, th there were certain like sketches of like messing around with like tone rows, even though I, I wouldn't say I was really um, somebody, you know, like schooled in it the way I, I would even be now. But just taking these cells of ideas and then um, putting them, you know, writing these like little pieces and then I would, I, I would kind of find, I would find a, um, sometimes I would take something like that and have a baseline and I'd take the melodic material mm -hmm. and place it over the baseline, but then I would just edit it. Mm, yeah. Just kind of be like, this is, this makes sense over this baseline or um so that was that was one of the things um <clears throat> some of some of it was just like more traditional 
composing, you know, yeah. some of it like that. Um, but also there, there was one tune, the first, the first track, um, Circular Woes was actually, yeah. it was all based on um, four note cells that were inverted or, or reversed. And it actually was the bass lines were also uh, written that way too. Oh, wow. So okay. at every point, each pass of the song of the melody, you'll have a different, you'll have a similar melodic thing, but you'll have a different, um, not, yeah, no, you'll have a different um, landing note for the bass. Like it'll land on the first time it might land on, on an E and then maybe it lands on a G or a D. I don't remember offhand, but so each time it was like, taking these notes and like and doing it was systematic i mm. just can't i have to like i'd have to look at it to remember yeah, exactly sure. yeah, how yeah. i did it but i actually had each each of the sections that was played that was um slightly different had a basically an inverted version a you know like a reverse version a retrograde version and maybe a you know, <clears throat> an inverted retrograde version. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this four four line, four note line. Interesting. And then it would always end on a different. And the bass line would do the same thing, um, basically by ending it. You know, the 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 pedal or the most um, the most recurring note that was really like yeah. in that phrase was the note that was definitely like would be considered like the tonic so to speak yeah okay yeah would always change so um i was i remember when i wrote that uh i was on the road i was actually with um john o'gallagher oh really i oh, really ben, oh, man. and ben monder and and jeff hirschfield we were on the we were on the tour oh wow and i was working on that i wrote a lot of that then i mean i pit you know that's when i was like kind of like working with this idea that explains you know, that a lot because john's music <laughs> yeah. can get there like that yeah know? right it's like something he would do that's it's funny yeah. it was funny and I, I i was just it was really yeah it was interesting i was just sitting there like oh let me try this <laughs> and but it's it takes you know that takes a long time actually yeah, sure. yeah just to do that just to get the materials and then actually the idea was to basically have the um, the meters expand and contract, so that was what was happening with the meters on that. Yeah, J Justin is killing it on that. Moment. Oh yeah, he's just yeah, yeah. No, it's ridiculous. Yeah, it's really <laughs> ridiculous. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. Bizarre. I mean, that was Such that that, that, that never became easy to play because it just it's just <laughs> it's so much information in one song, in yeah. one composition that you're just like man you know you it, you I, okay back to something you said before if you were on a tour for like you know a week two weeks you could start to get into something you know yeah. a little bit more i mean those guys played amazing over it obviously justin but just the idea that uh that you could play more freely as an improviser over i know too yeah. yeah oh yeah sure yeah you know yeah yeah but did you play gigs with that group a lot, like, or at that time, or no? Was that like not a lot? I mean, we did a few for sure, and I was trying to do other stuff, and yeah. it was just funny. It was like it was like almost as if at that time um, it was it was tricky because Vijay was really yeah becoming that's what really I mean yeah. yeah and so he would he was he was cool with doing gigs, but the but he wasn't available that much. Sure. And then what would happen would be that, you know, even a simple gig, you know, like playing like at like Cornelius Street Cafe, would, which isn't there anymore, would be like, yeah. well, is Jay going to be on the gig? You know, like that would be the, the question. The, oh, he man. continued yeah. on that. And it's like, yeah, you know, 
you know, and then he, he probably wasn't really that interested in playing down there at that point either. So, <laughs> you know, it became like this weird thing and, and I, I didn't, yeah, I just didn't have a lot of, uh, I didn't have a whole lot of luck with people with booking in New York. It's, it's really tricky. I mean, there, yeah, you know, I can imagine. Yeah. Sure. It can be, uh, I had, I, I felt like it was okay, but some of the places where I felt like it would have been the most appropriate were just not really all that receptive. So, yeah. sure. you know, you, you, it's like fighting an uphill battle sometimes, especially if you are, um, you know, you don't, the the whole the whole um backstory and narrative to 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 your project or to your brand or whatever you want to call it is such a is became more and more imperative to anybody who was booking you yeah yeah so you know that becomes another factor that you have to deal with but yeah, the compositional part. I mean, I'm writing, you know, some other stuff. I've I've have some. Oh, beautiful. I have some other things that I'm, you know, I'd like to do. Uh, so we'll see what happens. Yeah. You know, the next this next little bit. You know, it's there's some great there's some great musicians down here too. Um, so it's 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 uh, it's definitely been interesting. I had some good opportunities to do it couple recordings this past couple of years mm. that were that were really really nice so that you know that's been that's been cool i did this recording with um john diversa who's a trumpet player who runs the program there oh he's okay the, he's the chair of the the jazz department and but that was that was with um uh with gonzalo rubalcaba because gonzalo's there. really yeah, oh man gonzalo, yeah, How was that like, man? Oh, it's amazing. I mean, wow. it was a very... I didn't know that. Wow. Daphnis Prieto played drums. Oof. Oh, gee. Okay. And this uh, percussionist, Sammy Figueroa. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. So, wow. so we... It was a really beautiful record. It was mostly like... like Check um, it out. It was mostly boleros, you know, or that type of thing. It was mostly like ballads and stuff like that in a way mm. i mean there was some other stuff in it but it was very um it was very like you know controlled like it, there wasn't um the level of precision and stuff that was needed to to and and just simplicity yeah. was super was actually quite challenging because you really had to be very accurate and clear and it was it was a, a very challenging recording it came out really great I mean, mm. it's, you know, um but I, you know it was it's it was it was a tricky one to do you know it was but gonzalo was was amazing and it i think it probably went you know some of those other um there was a few Charlie Hayden records in the early 2000s. Yeah. That Gonzalo did. Though, yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. That yeah. style of that style. Oh, I love that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. That's know, so beautiful. That, yeah. that kind of thing. So, so I had to, I had to get into that vibe of really trying to be very, very like really approach it. Like, you know, Charlie Hayden and be very, uh, did you ever like, listen to Charlie? Simple. Like as a, yeah. Oh as, yeah. Yeah, there's some there's some recordings of Charlie that I that are uh, a couple of these. Well, there was one that was I think on the Soul Note label that was really interesting with him, and it was kind of his trio: Enrico Perinunzi at the time oh, yeah. and uh, Billy Higgins. Yeah, and uh, and um, oh God, why am I why am I spacing on his name? Um, Chet Baker. Oh yeah. Okay. And man, just such great stuff, you know. And then obviously, like the the stuff that he did, like uh, old new dreams and yeah, liberation or, or all that. Thing. Yeah, yeah. And then, but a couple of those, he did another. There was another uh, trio record with his trio too, where you get to hear him. Just the way he plays, his his ability to 
to kind of play over a form <laughs> while basically making these complete these like these musical and harmonic cadences mm. musical and harmonic cadences that are completely against what's actually happening in the form yeah and then he comes out like like he you know like nothing like there wasn't anything weird about any of it yeah you know and he's right on you know That's, you know what i mean yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's mastery, yeah. It's, I, I mean, it's just yeah. unbelievable. I that 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 that's like one of those things where it's like it, it, you can't you you can you can work on doing that, but only by by doing it. I mean, I don't, you know. I mean that that yeah. to me is just unbelievable. Some of the stuff that he does with that, but his his clarity and and definition and just complete like centeredness was what i needed to bring to that particular project mm. i mean in no way was it like you know tribute to charlie hayden or no, whatever, sure about but, just, but that was the vibe especially with gonzalo too having done those records with him yeah you know um but but gonzalo's yeah. really just unbelievable all those guys yeah Death. and so that was that was very very cool and I did this other record, record with a rec I'm like recording album record uh, uh, with this really great vocalist from um, she's Argentinian, but she lives here, Roxana Ahmed. And uh, yeah, her, she's uh, nominated for she's in the Latin Grammy stuff, but she's also um, hopefully something will get nominated in the, in the Grammys. Yeah. But uh but a really great record of a lot of mixture of styles and and um, I just play on two tracks of it. She had already recorded most of it. There were a couple more songs that she wanted to do, and I did one on electric and one on upright. Oh, wow. nice! And it came out really, it came wow. out really well. And she, she uh, it's called Ontology. If you yeah. get a chance, it's definitely yeah, I, I want to check it out. Yeah. yeah, it's cool. It's really beautiful. And she, she's a, she's really like there's she's a really excellent musician and an excellent singer and you 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 know like there's a lot of but she's 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 really really fantastic yeah so it's been interesting you know like being down here definitely some opportunities that wouldn't have occurred sure. if i would if you were yeah. yeah yeah so you know it, it's it's like trying to make it happen yeah Beautiful. <laughs> wherever you are yeah Beautiful. Cool, Carl. So thanks for sharing. Oh, yeah, definitely. Some of the thoughts, you know, on this uh, musical path you, you are still doing. Yeah. So that's beautiful. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I appreciate it. It's, yeah. it's there's a lot to it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dr. Jazz.